Uh, thanks, Marty, for having me host this panel. Uh, this amazing opportunity. Thank you. I'm very um, have a lot of gratitude. Thank you. Um, so uh, what I want to do is um, kick things off and do a rapid fire, one to two minutes. Um, who are you? What is your background? And is it a logical background for what you do now? Um, who would like to kick, to kick us off? I'm, I'm happy to, Jamal. Pat Lavecchia, Oasis Pro Markets. Uh, I'm also going to just quickly go through a slide, um, but uh, my background is investment banking, Wharton grad, investment banking. Um, uh, I ran uh, private equity placements globally at both uh, Bear Stearns, JP Morgan, and Credit Suisse. Then I uh, uh, ran capital markets for First Horizon, started my own broker dealer about four years ago, got into crypto. And um, in this whole blockchain space, I run uh, Oasis Pro Markets. Uh, we're raising capital. We're well funded by a major DeFi player. We're going to do a 20 million strategic round at some point. Um, but uh, we're unique because we got approved by the SEC and FINRA for digital cash, stablecoin CBDCs for digital securities. We're a multi asset um, digital ATS. And uh, one of our largest investors, along with myself, is a major DeFi player by the name of MakerDAO. So um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen and give you, I think this says it all uh, for everybody, just to get a sense of who we are. Um, I'm just going to, and this is going to be a handout for everybody. I hope you can see my screen, but this is a lay of the land in regards to the, uh, the uh, current uh, platforms out there. I, I, I'm assuming you, everyone can sh see my screen and that's where Oasis Pro Markets were approved for security tokens. We're down uh, pretty far down the process with the CFTC for derivatives and swaps. And um, so this is the lay of the land as to uh, what we're doing. Great, thank you. Um, Robert, next. What'd Robert next? Levin. Yes, thank you. Okay, Jamil, thank you. Uh, it's mm -hmm. great to be here. I'm Robert Levin. I'm CEO of Emerging Star Digital DeFi which is focused on decentralized finance tokens, and but we're market neutral. We'll buy puts and calls when we're at the top and bottom of cycle. So um, my background is uh, unusual in that I have over 15 years of Wall Street experience at a senior level working for Solomon Brothers, Paul Tudor Jones, Lewis Bacon as a trader and analyst and strategist in global macro and currencies and commodities. And so uh, last 15 years, I've been focused on artificial intelligence on mobile. I started investing in 2017 in cryptocurrencies and have built up a portfolio, mostly of DeFi tokens. The core position is Celsius, uh, which is up over 3,500%. But I'm not saying to anyone, we're gonna have another 3,500% uh, uh, three year period, but I, I'm very bullish on the DeFi sector of cryptocurrency. So we'll discuss that. Great, thank you. Uh, Paul. Hey guys, glad to be here. I'm a partner at Pantera Capital, one of the three general partners at Pantera Capital. Uh, I joined the space in 2014, so shortly after Marty, Pantera, Dan, and the Stephen brothers were getting into it, um, I joined around the same time. My background is I used to be an economic consultant. I also used to do business development and growth for some early stage startups. And then before Pantera, I was actually working at another VC firm focused on mobile. For Pantera, I focus on early stage investments. So everything from equity investments, early stage token investments, sourcing, executing, and taking board seats. Uh, for Pantera, you know, we manage about $5.5 billion of assets across early stage tokens, liquid trading tokens, and early stage venture capital. We invest all across the spectrum, everything from C to series B, and even some growth stage investments. We're doing everything from NFTs to DeFi to C5. So uh, we're pretty comprehensive in that aspect. Great, thank you. And my name is Jamil Hassan. I'm a podcast host with the Irish Tech News. I'm also an author, and I also have a small DeFi portfolio on the side myself. So it's great to be here. Um, so, you know, we're here to talk about, on this panel today, to talk about uh, blockchain and crypto strategy and valuations. And in order to talk about strategy, we have to lay out the land um, of what's going on out there, you know, in the market. From what I see, and there might be more, but um, from what I see, we have an ambiguous U.S. regulatory environment. 
We have, um, you know, misinformation in across the media. Uh, we have uh, mixed signals from corporations. And we also have, you know, mania going on in the NFT space. There may be more things. I don't ask about that. Uh, but how how have you been able to, each of you have been able to navigate this current environment? Um, what are you doing well? And what strategies have you seen that have been working? Whoever would like to go. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll start again. And by the way, hi to everybody in the room. I, I was out there for the last two days and took the red eye back. So um, <laughs> it was a lot of fun out there. Um, so look, the regulators are laser focused on this space right now. In fact, it's it's heightened since Gensler came in and he's building out his team. We spend, we spend a lot of time with the SEC, FinHub and FINRA and the CFTC having discussions about tokens, digital securities, et cetera. Um, one of the most frequent questions we get from regulators is, is this particular potential issue a digital token subject to the Howey test? And that was a Supreme Court case where when does a transaction qualify as an investment contract? So that's, that's the definition of a security. I think that just one comment regarding NFTs, one of the commissioners, Hester Peirce, came out about two months ago, and she's the most bullish at the SEC in regards to uh, blockchain and crypto. And she suggested with, with NFTs that they became fractionalized that she thought they probably would be security. So that's an area of, of interest. But our approach has always been in regards to navigation, uh, uh, re regulatory first, compliance first. I'm a banker by background. I, you know, that that's what I cut my teeth on uh, with the major banks, and that's our approach. Now, with Gensler coming through, getting an ATS license is extremely difficult. We did it in about nine and a half months. That's because of all the previous work done by some of our co-opetition out there. But since Gensler's coming in, I believe based on what I've heard and I, I, we've been approached by acquirers who have told us that they believe the process now will take two to two and a half years. Everything has ground to a halt in regards to digital until they're able to uh, regulatory, um, uh, sorry, there was some background noise there, but regulation by enforcement is going to be the, uh, the way forward. Robert, uh, Robert, you had some interesting comments about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So my opinion is that uh, regulation is uh, increasing in the U.S. relative to other jurisdictions. So people are conducting jurisdiction arbitrage, going to other jurisdictions like uh, the United Kingdom, where they have a regulatory sandbox. And uh, so, for example, three years ago, I almost invested in Celsius in the US jurisdiction, and then they switched to a British jurisdiction well, we're inside the regulatory sandbox. So it made it a lot easier for them to avoid scrutiny by the SEC. Uh, the SEC has been cracking down on scams. For example, they just brought a $2 billion Bitcoin related investment scam uh, action, um, claiming fraud against the perpetrators. And um, they've issued regulatory guidance that uh, people should avoid uh, promises of guaranteed high returns, avoid unregistered sellers uh, who are not regulated brokers, avoid um, claims of skyrocketing account values and uh, other types of too good to be true fake, testimo fake testimonials. So there's a lot of hype, a lot of noise. And what we're doing is trying to get the signal to noise ratio right and conduct legal due diligence before we invest. What do you see out there in Silicon Valley, Paul? Yeah, you know, we've been investing in this space for a long time. And even before there were tokens, uh, when there was just Bitcoin and there were just centralized companies, uh, we've always taken the approach of investing into teams that were always thinking about regulations, making sure that they can get the right licenses, especially around FinCEN, around money transmission licenses, state by state. And, you know, that's been... Uh, true, not only domestically, but also internationally as we've invested into both local exchanges, local brokerages, and also payment companies. But now that we've entered the world of DeFi and NFTs, uh, every single time we look at a project, we want to make sure that they are in the right jurisdiction, 
uh, we believe that there is a utility for a token and that the project uh, can be, you know, fully decentralized at the end of the day and also have a product with a functioning token before they actually issue their token. And then, of course, we have a lot of top lawyers that we work with to really help us understand the regulatory landscape. Uh, in terms of regulations itself, uh, I do think that it's a good thing that the SEC and the CFTC are actually having conversations with projects and that it's taking a little bit longer to come up with a bit more clarity on what's going on. I think uh, the worst thing that could happen would be coming out with something that hinders innovation. So the longer they take, I actually think the better it is for our industry. And we have to take a role out there to continue to educate those around us um, and help give some guidance on what good regulations could be. But as of right now, uh, our strategy is to take a very, very diversified approach, investing into not only uh, decentralized applications and DeFi, but also, you know, the infrastructure underlying it, which should be probably a little bit less uh, subject to regulatory um, uncertainty as those guys are, you know, getting licenses and things like that. So let's see if I understand you correctly. You said in, in the in the in the short term, the un, the lack of clarity in the short term will help strengthen the clarity in the long term, medium and long term. I think it can. I think uh, right now there's a huge education process that's happening with regulators. And so the more time that they can spend on this without making any rush judgments, I think the better. What, what are you guys saying, Robert and Pat? On the regulatory issue. So the, uh, I, I think that Hester Pierce, who works for Gary Getzler and has developed a staff to monitor uh, potential fraud. And uh, so when BlockFi, for example, announced uh, the S1, um, three state regulators issued cease and desist, but the federal did not. So uh, because they had, you know, state regulators would like them to register all of their client base, for example. Um, Binance cannot market in Texas, for example, but other jurisdictions in the US, they can. So I think that the state regulators uh, can slow down and put up speed bumps, but Generally, it's up to the SEC to determine nationwide whether or not a, a new protocol can advance and start selling to retail. But institutions are, have compliance departments and they're very careful and major institutions are entering the market, as you know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with the approach. And I think, you know, in the long term, this is all very good for the industry. Um, I think in 10 years, it's going to be ubiquitous, five to 10 years, and we're going to look back and say to ourselves, why didn't it occur t a decade earlier? Uh, but I do, I, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're in the heart of regulation and compliance, speaking to the regulators. I, you know, I think, well, I, I feel quite certain that it's going to be regulation by enforcement in the short term, because Congress can't really get their act together regards to the regulation that Gensler would like to see. It's just very low on the agenda. I, uh, I, uh, but I, you know, but actions are being taken. Uniswap, one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, AMMs out there got a Wells notice. So that's come out. And so there's a lot of pressure there. And <laughs> there's a question, is that a utility? Is it a security? And you know, a Wells notice is quite serious. Uh, we know them well. Uh, we know all the players out in the market. And uh, we think they'll get through it working, working with the regulators, but fines are coming. And uh, probably until the election of next year, November, so there's more cl clarity in regards to um, uh, Congress. Uh, I think we're really not gonna see much in terms of regulations to the points both uh, Robert and, uh, and Paul mentioned earlier. Got it. Okay, so uh, let's talk about valuations, all right? Robert, there could be, Robert, you have to uh, put yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Okay, so uh, let's talk about let's talk about let's talk about valuations, right? There can be valuations of both, you know, public, decent, fully, completely decentralized protocols, like, um, and then also uh, of private, you know, VC backed, early distribution, equity stake protocols, right? How do your specific valuations differ between the two? And um, what is your focus looking at each one under the circumstances that you set aside to look at it? Uh, I'll start with Paul. Yeah, so we invest into both 
uh, early stage equity and early stage tokens. So what I would consider the private markets. And then we also actively trade cryptocurrencies that are pretty liquid on legitimate exchanges uh, in the public markets. And so on the private market side of things, you know, it, it's a combination of looking at the space that the uh, project is in and being able to see what other comps are out there, both on the private and public side, and then balancing that out with sort of what we're seeing in the venture capital market for uh, cryptocurrencies in general, um, whether it's uh, a bull market, whether it's a bear market, what other VCs are involved. And then I think the other sort of factor to kind of put in there is really the background of the team. At the end of the day, you're backing teams that can, you know, execute on product, execute on user acquisition, uh, execute on pivoting if they need to. So um, I really sort of take into account those three factors, the market itself, the comps and the team and their backgrounds and relevancy of their backgrounds to determine uh, sort of a fair valuation. And uh, that's kind of what I'm seeing on the early stage side. Now on tokens, it's fairly similar. I would say that uh, the valuation for a token network is probably on average two times the valuation of an equity deal, uh, just because you know uh, the company itself usually takes about or about 50% of the token network. So that's one way to sort of uh, frame the numbers between equity versus a token network. And I think most of the early stage deals right now, you're investing and in hopefully getting both equity and tokens just to make sure that you're aligned because at the end of the day, these are early stage companies. Uh, you know, early stage companies pivot in terms of their business model. So whether it's a token business model, whether it's uh, you know, a revenue business model, you never are quite sure. So if you're pretty uncertain and uh, if it's fairly early, I'd probably invest and get both. On the public side of things, you know, the way that we look at things is, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think there's this whole Bitcoin dominance um, and, and, and when Bitcoin dominance reaches a certain number, and let's just say 30, 40%, then, um, you know, usually people pile back into Bitcoin or when Bitcoin dominance reaches 70, 80%, people move back into Ethereum. So that's one way to sort of look at the two largest cryptocurrencies. And then beyond that, when you start looking at things like DeFi, um, you can compare them relative to each other in terms of layer ones, layer twos, uh, stable coins, lending, borrowing, et cetera, and be able to do relative valuations. But you can also look at the cash flows that are coming through each of these platforms and run a DCF or run a multiples analysis to determine uh, how each of these protocols compare against each other. And so that's how you can determine how to size these investments. And of course, for us, like we're pretty fundamental in terms of what types of companies should be accruing value. So a lot of our investments on the liquid side of things revolve around layer ones, scalability, lending and borrowing, exchanges, um, you know, things like insurance, et cetera. Great. Robert. Uh, Robert. Yeah, so uh, we're focused on DeFi protocols. So we're only focused on investing in DeFi protocols that have uh, positive cash flows. So, and also very seasoned teams with the right level of compliance and transparency and reporting and accountability. Uh, so that's very important to us as well. We see two types of metrics for valuations, qualitative metrics uh, and quantitative metrics. And qualitative, we see narrative driven metrics like MEMS uh, and sentiment driven and branding. Um, on the, and we're more interested in quantitative protocols, which are more grounded and more traditional, uh, but there's different nomenclature compared to traditional financial ratios. But let's just say that earnings are very important, protocol earnings accruing to the token equals the profit margin, and every protocol allocates cash flow to the token, uh, it, with a couple of exceptions. So, for example, Uniswap has no cash flow accruing to the Uni token. The SushiSwap, which also competes in the DeFi uh, space, directs about 16% of their swap fees to Sushi token holders. Uh, price to sales metric, uh, market is equivalent to market cap to uh, net revenues is an important uh, metric. So the metrics are evolving. Obviously they're useful only for comparison within subsectors and not across um, 
the value chain between sectors or subsectors. So the major sectors are lending uh, in DeFi, followed by exchanges like Uniswap and SushiSwap, uh, and then payment protocols. And there's others like derivatives and asset management protocols. So we're looking at uh, quantitative metrics more than sentiment and narrative metrics. Got it. How about you, Pat? I I, I, you know, I would agree with uh, both uh, the approach that Paul and Robert laid out. I, I'll take a, rather than repeat that, I'll, I'll, I'll take somewhat of a different view, which is um, uh, Bitcoin, it, it, to me, let's start there. That, to me, is a commodity. It's not really in the DeFi space. You can't build up on it. What you have with ETH is it's a foundation that many of these other protocols and DeFi projects are built upon. So I'm excited about both, but really ETH to me is the big investment. And I continue to invest in that every day, uh, in, including some DeFi projects. What I look at is the team, as has been mentioned, fraud, you know, due diligence and governance. A lot of these DeFi projects are tied to governance of the community. And I look into that very, uh, in a very detailed way. And, you know, my knowledge base of, my knowledge base to MakerDAO, uh, you know, is one of the best governance communities out there. And it's now become, if the others aren't familiar with it, uh, it's about to become a full DAO, completely decentralized, which uh, is amazing from where they started. But in regards to family offices with long-term horizons, gener one generation, two generations, three generations, you know, I think if you invest in those two and a couple of DeFi projects as they come up, Solana, et cetera, you know, Uniswap, if the governance community agrees to actually charge fees, which they haven't yet. Um, yeah, you know, over a decade, two decades, multiple generations, this is going to turn out to be a winner, in my opinion. Um, one family office told me recently that five years ago, they had the opportunity to invest in Coinbase. And I believe the valuation was about 400 $400 million. It's currently trading at $65 billion in five years. So that was a nation market then. It grew. Obviously, it's grown quite well. But that gives a sense of what the opportunity is. And we're really at the, um, the initial stages. Uh, some may say, you know, it's 12 years old or thereabouts, 11 years old. But I, I still think we're, you know, uh, about to get up to bat. I, I still think this is, it's 2 trillion in size. It just, the DeFi space just surpassed that. Um, there's tremendous upside opportunity. So from a family office standpoint, I think that, you know, rather than, you know, be, uh, you know, focused on the fluctuations, which are scary and will occur. If you, if you buy and hold similar to real estate and uh, see where, you know, the market is in a decade, I think everybody would be quite happy. I hope so. <laughs> um, so I want to I have a question about for family offices, but I want to I want to start with uh, back up a little bit. And so we talked about DeFi, right? We talked about, you know, commodities. I want to talk about how do you value an NFT? How do you value art? Um, the crazy, crazy valuations going on right now. And um, I think it's more object or subjective than objective. But how do you begin to do that? Whoever they could go, let me know. Robert's talking give a third, mm -hmm. If I can give a 30 second overview of the state of the market, it's, it's up about 300% in the NFT index in the last three and a half, four months. So the market um, is, I would say overvalued and we peaked about seven, eight days ago in the NFT index. And um, so that we have a very frothy uh, overheated NFT market Going back to the issue of valuations, the underlying assets, you have to analyze the provenance, the, the lineage of music or art in comparison to their comps. So that's just very briefly, but the, the whole uh, market is very stratified from Christie's at the top end selling three to $10 million NFTs to um, OpenSea, which is selling retail to the average investor. So there's, you have to look at different market segments and the lineage and protocol uh, underlying each uh, NFT and analyze its smart contract. Paul? 
Yeah, I can go next. I mean, so at Pantera, we don't invest directly into NFTs. Uh, there are other funds out there that do do that. And there are other DAOs that do that. You know, what we do is we invest into the underlying technologies or the underlying platform. So whether it's a platform that helps uh, developers build NFT companies or platforms that uh, help artists uh, issue NFTs, uh, whether it's an existing product or a new product that does that, or whether it's something that maybe helps fractionalize NFTs or other tools for creators to help build NFTs. So that's what we're investing into now. In terms of the NFTs themselves, um, I think the ones that do have quite a bit of value right now are the ones that are tied to either brands or artists or are tied to and or are tied to certain perks or rights based off of that particular brand or artist. I think there will be um, there will be a time where you know more creators and more brands are built because of NFTs and NFT discovery. But right now, I mean, the early adopters and the early buyers of NFTs are just, you know, crypto whales. And therefore, it's, um, you know, it, it's quite frothy because we are in a bull market and there's a lot of money to go around. A lot of people are, are sort of supporting this idea. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So, you know, if you, if you think that this NFT has value, you put the money to it, you just better hope that other people see the same thing as you. Um, I think the market will correct itself, you know, especially as we open up the uh, the platforms to more mainstream users, and there could be more price discovery. But right now, I do agree with Robert that it's it's pretty frothy out there, and um, we're we're not taking any bets directly into NFT at this moment. Okay. Um, yeah, it's very frothy. I uh, I take the approach. I'm an angel investor as well. I've in, I've invested in three platforms: two related to art, one related to music, uh, and creating ecosystems around that, which is uh, you know very cool. I you know I can't begin to understand some of these crypto punk valuations and some of these uh, gorilla valuations out there. Drunken gorilla, I think, is very popular, but um, yeah. Uh, well said, Paul. Beauty's in the. I mean, who could say what the Mona Lisa is worth? Uh, at the end of the day, I, I take the same approach. I think it's very frothy. That's why I haven't purchased any. I probably will just for the heck of it to have something. But um, I think the platforms are very exciting. Great. Um, yeah, I was calling myself the crypto hipster with Ars Tech News, and then. Um, somebody in Russia, and an artist said, you know, these are my, this is my crypto hipsters. Um, I, I wouldn't mind if you uh, stop calling yourself that. Like, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so I did. Um, so let's talk about, you know, an untapped area to bring back the family office conversation An untapped area, you know, that continues to, you know, with more than 10,000 tokens out there now is, um, you know, consolidation of the industry, um, possibly. Uh, M and A, you know, um, what's you know, how can how can family offices get in on the on the M and A um, side and, and start buying, you know, some of the protocols if they want to, um, and get on, in on the action? How can they do that? Uh, I guess I can start there. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's a few different ways that you can go about it. You know, you can take the approach that Pat mentioned, which is you can start with buying some Bitcoin and you can do so, uh, you know, through your Coinbase or, you know, Grayscale or other sort of private and, and more public options out there. You can then dabble into Ethereum, which I think is the operating system for the entire industry right now. And then if you wanted to go beyond that yourself, you could dabble a little bit into some of the DeFi tokens now. Uh, beyond that, though, if you really, you know, beyond Bitcoin, I think you really don't want to think about, you know, which ones are promising and, and how to spread your bets across, you know, a, a number of different tokens. Uh, there's starting to be indexes that are arising. So Bitwise has come up with a DeFi index. And there are other indexes, I think, that emerge for NFTs that you can get exposure to a wide variety of different uh, tokens that are market uh, market cap weighted, things like that. So I think there's gonna be more bundling of options 
um, or even potentially, uh, as, as Robert mentioned, asset management protocols or, or yield optimizers, things like that, where you can park some of your money into more sort of stable assets and get yield. And then beyond that, I mean, in terms of getting exposure, you can um, invest with a fund manager that charges a fee, but can get you into different strategies and companies that you could normally not get into probably would be sur uh, surrounding the private markets uh, versus uh, but even public market investing. I mean, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum are up like maybe 50 to hundred percent this year, while our liquid token funds are up, you know, three, 400 percent. So active management, even on liquid side can, pro can provide alpha, but on the early stage side, our early stage funds range from, you know, 10 to 15 times capital to even, even higher than that. So uh, it's definitely more risk, but more reward on the early stage side of things. And to touch upon um, the question around consolidation, I do think that there is going to be a lot of consolidation that happens, which should bode well for both public and private investments. Um, Coinbase, Binance, some of the larger asset managers and exchanges are all going to be making purchases. There's a lot of capital out there. There's a need for talent and need for technology. So we are going to see a lot more consolidation from centralized companies to centralized companies, but we're also going to see some really interesting acquisitions between token projects too. And there was one example where Polygon acquired Hermes. Uh, and, and basically what happens is people were able to swap their Hermes tokens for Polygon tokens at a certain ratio. So we're going to start seeing M&A all across the board and it'll be helpful especially for early stage investors uh, to be able to get some returns on liquidity that way. I'm sorry, just to clarify, that consolidation is primarily in the token-based companies? Yes, yeah. yeah, on that one. Robert? Uh, Robert. I'll, I'll just jump, yeah, I'll jump in oh, next. Uh, industry not, consolidation is inevitable. Um, there are many platforms, protocols, other players have strong synergies. You know, I mentioned earlier that we have these licenses, we're launching, uh, fourth quarter of this year. And uh, we've already been approached by, um, I can't mention who, but some well-known groups out there who are worried about regulation, who are worried they don't have the proper licenses. And uh, we haven't even launched yet. So it's, it's definitely happening. There's also, banks are, are playing an increasingly smaller role in the financial system because of DeFi. And they're going to be forced to adapt. And one way to catch up for them quickly is through acquisition. The banks are doing a lot of R&D. When I say banks, just financial services firms in general. And uh, we're in discussions with them, we, you know, as potential partners, et cetera. When, when that tipping point occurs for digital assets, and two trillion is not a tipping point yet, uh, so it may be five, it may be 10 trillion, they're going to come in in a big way. And we're seeing it right now. They are, there's one bank uh, it, one of the largest international banks in the world. Over the last um, over the last five years, they've had an internal blockchain system, a private blockchain system for FX, and they shared with us that they traded two trillion dollars over the last five years internally, somewhat similar to the JP Morgan, Morgan coin, but it's something that's definitely happening. Additionally, now uh, I don't know if uh, all of you saw the news, but Steve Cohen, a, you know, well-known trader. Uh, just invested in a quant trading group called Radical, which is part of GTS, which is one of the top three market makers, traditional market makers in dark pools and the exchanges. So that's going to be a highly, um, highly, uh, highly volatile fund, uh, but they're looking for investors. So I, I think the fund, the active fund management um, approach is probably the, the best approach here because uh, you know, if you're trying to do it yourself, unless you have some deep knowledge in the space for yield farming and some other components, I, you know, you could lose, you could, you could lose as much as you could gain. I'd like to um, add, in addition to the M&A market, there's going to be many exits in the next 12, 24 months until the Fed starts tapering and closing the IPO window. Until then, we're going to see a number of IPOs, for example, Genesis is going public in the next 12, 24 months. Uh, and um, BlockFi is going public. It's currently a $3 billion valuation. And if Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs underwrites and it takes it public on NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, uh, it could go to, it could double or triple. 
uh, similar to what happened with the CFI company uh, Coinbase. So we have a robust uh, IPO market. We're going to see a lot of DeFi and CFI companies going public until uh, the Fed starts tapering. In the meantime, we have a $2.1 trillion market cap. Uh, it's near all time highs for the total crypto universe of which uh, DeFi is about 400 names uh, and a total value lock close to 100 billion. Uh, peaked at about actually 96 billion a few weeks ago. So it's now 91 billion total value locked in DeFi and about 450 names. So I think that you're gonna see more, as I agree with the panel, there's gonna be a lot of consolidation and most of the market cap will be concentrated in the top uh, 100 tokens. So Solano is up 13,000% this year, could be overvalued by a thousand percent or more. You know, so we have to be careful uh, to see that most of these valuations are liquidity driven. And we have to remember that uh, price earnings ratios are not um, all equal. Some are based on um, uh, narratives and some are based on actual cash flow. Uh, so sushi swap is a price earnings ratio of 49, maker is a price earnings price earnings ratio of 21, but it's very hard to say that uh, maker is undervalued compared to sushi swap. So we have to be very careful when companies are being bought uh, and what valuations, you know. Um, so I'm gonna uh, ask Marty, do we have any Q&A from the floor? Hold on a second here. Uh, yeah, you got a question? Yeah. Hey, yield, what are you saying? Yield? Yeah. Yeah, yield is basically when you are, you know, you can lend out uh, your cryptocurrency and you can get uh, yield as in sort of, uh, I guess, income from it, uh, either in that currency that you lend it out or in a different currency. So that's, that's the yield that they're talking about is basically lending out, staking your cryptocurrency and being able to get something back for it. I think you can do, when you, I guess, are doing due diligence on something, you can, you have to look at yield something. Um, yield. Um, I don't look at yield when I evaluate a company, but I do look at it if I'm liquidity mining or if I'm determining uh, whether to put money in a certain protocol for yield versus another one, but it's not really part of our due diligence process. Maybe someone else caught. Um... Well, I'll ask on top of that and say, you know, uh, there's a, there's been a comparison, and I saw it on Twitter. I don't know about who, but I think it was by a lawyer that said um, the yield the yield of DeFi is equivalent to bond to to corporate bonds. I don't know how, if how uh, you gentlemen look at it that way. Um, and if so, what, what does that, what additional challenges that provide the market, right? Uh, I, I look at yield, I, I guess, from if you're sort of staking uh, behind sort of a, a layer one like ETH, um, I sort of look at yield similar to corporate bond as sort of fixed income, very, very steady. But of course, like those are for more like mature projects. Um, if, if I'm putting liquidity into an earlier stage project that's you know sort of promising very high octane yield then i consider that more of a speculative bet on um or more of a trade nationally like corporate bond okay so, yeah. it's, it's fair to mention something about doing to do something with the key thing so that's not okay. gary you got a question yeah i had a question you know about six months ago <clears throat> i did uh moderate the family deal off of, of making a panel. And so I said, you know, Democratic Congress is going to overplay their hand. They're going to spend so much money that all the money in the world will be spent. And about the only uh, way they're going to be handled anything after that would be to, to invent a coin, mine the first 10 million themselves, so they'll be able to sell it. And I says, Joe Biden could go out and, and he could call it an Obama coin. And that uh, and they'd say no good Democrat could be without one. And so, you know, it's funny because uh, it wasn't too long ago that Janet Yellen talked to the Coinbase uh, uh, CEO about something like that. So I'm wondering, you know, all this money's being made, but the government is sort of in that old time business of actually having to issue bonds sold by the Federal Reserve. 
and uh, they're not, you know, it seems like they're missing an opportunity, you know, they're, they're missing something big, you know, okay, so Hunter, Hunter gets a, a little rake off of a few stray things, but that's mean it's compared to the whole darn thing. So will they start thinking broader and say, we're going to go into this? Well, you know, hey, Gary. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, you got to you gotta get the Latin to dig in on Hunter. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so, so. I think you need tap Hunter, the old Hollywood movie. Yeah, I mean, Continue. <laughs> So what do you I, think? Do you think they're going to go in and, and, and sort of monetize some of this I, stuff? I, well, I don't know about the U.S. I can't go into details, but we're uh, we're doing a um, MOU with a developing country utilizing our technology, our ma matching engine for so with uh, one of the protocols mentioned today um, uh, for uh, sovereign debt issuance mm -hmm. to their citizenry, institutions, and diaspora. On a fractionalized basis, uh, the 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 savings we estimate for them are anywhere between thirty and fifty basis points on the issue size, and uh, so these developing nations that don't have many options, it's a very closed market in the sovereign in the sovereign arena. There, you know, there's only a a host of banks and and groups that that tend to do it that. That that is happening. I'm not sure about the U.S. I, you know, I think the U.S. will be late to that particular game. I just want to address something that that Pat brings up, which is that there, there you know, everybody who's been looking at crypto and Bitcoin forever has always said there's a couple of you know steps up, all based on one thing happens and another thing happens, blah 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 blah. And, and one of the big steps, of course, was when corporate America Treasury started buying Bitcoin, which happened in the last mm -hmm. 12 months, right? A big step up. Every time there's a halving, there's a big step up, which is going to continue, right? There's a whole theory, hypothesis around that. And then the other one was that once countries start adopting, which I guess El Salvador has done, yeah. and they think Panama is next, or Panama has some kind of thing going on with parity. And, you know, so, so the reality has always been there's really only 15 tradable currencies out there. And everything, if you, if you go to, to any of the emerging markets, everybody's asking you for dollars. So, 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 so that was another inevitability was once countries start adopting this stuff, then that changes things, right? So continue. So what are you guys so, uh, uh, waiting now to go out and buy your Obama coins? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> waiting for that Obama coin. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So Robert, Robert, you want to, <laughs> Robert, you to so, add to the... The Atlantic Council uh, monitors 83 countries, their currency unions, if they're linked to the dollar, they're linked to the euro, and uh, which ones are in pilots for government uh, issued crypto, which are called central bank digital uh, currencies, CBDCs. Everyone on the panel is familiar with it. Probably most people uh, in this audience are familiar with it as well. So when, uh, what's the motivation for issuing a CBDC? For a central bank, it's primarily uh, to uh, help uh, control capital flows and collect taxes and monitor uh, what's happening in their domestic uh, market and also prevent money laundering. So those are the three major reasons for a central bank digital currency. And then there's over 40 uh, in the production pipeline. Eventually, there'll be 80 and 100. So it will be ubiquitous. Probably there'll be a global treaty and a global standard uh, eventually, because it, the central banks have uh, one interest in common is preventing uh, uh, uncontrolled capital flows and preventing money laundering and preventing terrorist financing. So that's the reason why they're involved. And I think it's important to keep in mind that it doesn't mean that they're going to monopolize. Uh, there'll be con more countries like uh, El Salvador uh, that are interested in uh, not necessarily issuing their own currency, but adopting a stable coin as a, an, an alternative to the dollar uh, for stabilizing their currency. So we'll see a lot of hybrid models in uh, currency regimes uh, as we go forward. Robert, I think that, that the whole policy part on money laundering, you know, is almost unbelievable given, you know, what happened with Wachovia when they laundered, you know, half a trillion dollars of Mexican drug board money. Right, and they got like a couple, you know, tens of millions of dollar fine. So, 
So we know it's a policy statement, but whether, you know, it's just a statement that's actually meant to slow the adoption of other, you know, cryptocurrencies that are not, uh, you know, owned by sovereigns. Any thoughts? Okay. You couldn't I hear the know. question. You could repeat the uh, question. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking you to share your thoughts on that. I mean, I'm just saying Wachovia, it, it's hard to believe a statement on money laundering when Wachovia got a slap on the wrist, or actually it was Wells Fargo for Wachovia's money laundering of half a trillion dollars, right? And we've had Dan Moriad on many times talking about how it's very difficult to launder yeah. lots of money through Bitcoin. Well, you know, most, right. most of the money laundering is not in crypto, it's in fiat currencies. What, what What's happened is there's been a slate of ransomware attacks on hospitals and uh, pipelines and infrastructure uh, companies. And uh, the FBI and SEC would like to crack down on ransomware and fraud uh, using crypto because it's just another way to commit fraud is uh, trying to hide uh, behind an anonymous uh, address. But there is a patent on de-anonymizing addresses so I think that technology counter strikes will evolve to uh, to protect both consumers and institutions from randomware, mostly upgrading cybersecurity. So effectively, this whole field of cybersecurity is one major policy factor in regulating crypto. And we'll see uh, someday, five, 10 years from now, uh, unprotected infrastructure that is not quantum resistant being uh, pulverized by quantum attacks. So that. That's of course where we have to develop quantum resistant infrastructure, not only for crypto, but also for traditional uh, financial architecture and traditional in information infrastructure. Yeah, Marty, you're, you're right on what Dan has mentioned. I mean, we've been able to catch even corrupt FBI folks trying to launder money using cryptocurrency. So it's not, it, it's definitely not better than fiat. And I think what I'm most interested in seeing is the China digital currency that's coming out. Uh, they've already had pilots out there in um, Hangzhou and they're gonna do a ton of airdropping. Uh, I think it's definitely going to be interesting to see, you know, how much, uh, how much control they're gonna have over that and what kind of comes out from that. I mean, how that affects the cryptocurrency market. I actually think it's a great thing. I think it's gonna drive people into decentralized currencies and, uh, and on top of that, it's also going to get people a lot more familiar with digital money and digital cash. And so I think that whole initiative, while it's going to be great for China, it's uh, going to be even greater for cryptocurrencies and globally too. And again, for a political point of view, I don't think there's any doubt right now that China is having some kind of a capital crisis because they, they're obviously they have clamped down on the cryptocurrencies. It's a big <clears throat> clamp down. I think it was in Wall Street Journal yesterday. They, in Macau that's going yep, on, yep. which is a known money laundering center, right? So so there's something going on there that's you know driving all this stuff. So. Yeah, and I, I would just add CBD, we got approved. You know, I started off by saying digital cash for digital currencies for our ATS here in the US. We, we applied for CBDCs and we had to explain to the regulators what that was because we did that in February of 20, <laughs> 2020. So um, yeah, I, you know, uh, Beijing's doing it for control, a variety of reasons already outlined here. Um, I sit on the foundation board of the US Chamber in DC as well. And they started looking into this, the chamber did about a year and a half ago. And they had a, a small working group of individuals like myself providing information. Their concern from a American competitiveness standpoint is that China, it, you know, who's the furthest along, I, I believe they've been working on this since 14, 13, is seeking to become the reserve currency of the world. So um, they, they started pushing hard, educating a whole host of, um, of uh, members of Congress. I, I, uh, uh, our, I'm, we're based in Connecticut, right next to New York. Our local congressman is number two in the financial services uh, committee, Jim Himes. I've spent time with him. He actually had a subcommittee about a month ago, specifically about CBDCs here in the U.S. So there is movement. But again, to my earlier comments, I, we've got, you know, with the tax issues in regard, we haven't even touched upon that, that's come to crypto based on the infrastructure bill, et cetera. There's a, there's a long haul here before the U.S. Uh, enters 
enters this area. Jamil? Um, yeah, yeah, so um, how much time do I have, Marty? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So let's talk about the tax issue. What are the tax implications of this new HR 3684 bill uh, the way it stands today? Um, and what, what can, can we navigate it? It's scary. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so basically, it, 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 it would require a whole, not the money transmitter exchanges. The exchanges actually that we've mentioned aren't really touched by this, but the miners, et cetera, all these developing um, ecosystems here in the U.S., uh, would have to report basically almost every transaction, which is a you know momentous task at this point in time. Um, there's also um, I, you know there are also issues as to when you sell a specific um, uh, crypto. Let's say you sell uh, you know a Uniswap token or you convert it to stablecoin. Is that a transaction? Is that a game? There, there's still a question about all that. Um, so that's all still being developed. But, you know, this was put together there. You know, it, it shows that the lobbying effort in the crypto space has been quite weak. There are a whole host of associations. We belong to Adam, but there's a blockchain association, Chamber of Digital Commerce, et cetera. And they haven't really been lobbying. Um, I think that this was a wake up call for the industry and going forward, the big the big players are starting to hire some deep, yeah, deep, very knowledgeable and providing deep pockets to lobbying Congress. Unfortunately, it was a little too late and the entire industry was caught by surprise. It's a game changer and, and could hamper growth. That, that's my opinion. Paul, Robert. There's, there's another piece of in, um, innovation legislation that is, on the other side, tax policy, unfortunately, went in reverse for crypto, but uh, there's also a US Innovation and Competition Act that the Senate passed late last uh, you know, June, and, um, and it's going to increase uh, total investment in emerging technologies by 250 billion to help the US become more competitive with China. So unfortunately, I, you know, cryptography is part of it, cybersecurity is part of it, but it's not yet um, specific to um, to cryptocurrency. So I think what's happening is that, that we need more encryption, we need more cybersecurity innovation and adoption of the existing state of the art cybersecurity. And that's why uh, the encryption inherent in uh, cryptocurrency protocols and digital ledger technologies and protocol innovation is extremely important. Uh, to help achieve our cybersecurity goals and competitiveness goals. Paul? Yeah, I, I echo what both the panels have mentioned. Uh, from our point of view, you know, we are one of the larger funds and brands out there. So while it was, um, you know, it was motivating to see how many people tried to rally at the end and call their senators and uh, put a, as much out there on crypto Twitter as possible. You know, we should have been doing probably a bit more along the way, uh, all the way up until this point. But it, it is a growing pain of the industry where it, it, it grew so fast. And, you know, Congress was about to make a decision on, you know, protocols, proof of work, proof of stake that they really just didn't understand. And therefore, you know, being in a position that we are in, we're going to continue to, you know, hire folks on our side, be part of, you know, organizations that we think can push uh, forward, you know, the, the right sort of marketing, the right sort of education to the right people out there, and hopefully make a difference in some of the elections. So definitely a wake up call for us and a motivation to try to figure out like what we can do um, to, to really just kind of be thought leaders here. So one of the things that Paul and I talked about the other day briefly was I did an analysis of the um, of the companies that Goldman Sachs picked in the selective index versus the uh, funds that are in Grayscale's DeFi index to see if there was any correlation. And everything's there's a lot of correlation, um, except the one area that's not correlated to anything is the Dow, is the curve Dow. So 
based on the legislation today, um, do you think a strategy, an effective strategy to comply with the law at the same time keep DeFi DeFi would be to build out more DAO entities to be able to do that? What are your thoughts? Uh, I guess I can start. I mean, I think in general, um, you know, the more decentralized these projects are, you know, I think the, the better chance they have of just having their projects continue to succeed. And uh, a big reason uh, why they succeed is because there is a token out there to be able to further help with that decentralization. But you know, for that decentralization to occur, there needs to be actual usage of that token and control over the direction of the project uh, from the community members. So one of the areas that we continue to look at and invest into are DAOs, but really tooling around DAOs and software that makes it a lot easier for people to get notified on what's going on, be able to participate, uh, be able to rally folks around certain initiatives, um, be able to coordinate, be able to get incentives to be able to coordinate over certain things. And so that's been a pretty large focus for us. I believe that the DAO ecosystem in terms of the number of DAOs and the types of DAOs out there, whether it is for like software purposes or project purposes, or whether it's more for even investment purposes, will continue to um, get larger and larger. So, you know, we're, we're trying to make a bet on that infrastructure. I'm even starting to see incubators uh, launching DAOs too. I think, I think every time there is a group of folks together and there are meaningful actions to take, then, you know, you're probably gonna end up seeing a DAO. So I think DAOs are definitely gonna be a big part of uh, the future of decentralization. What do you think, Pat? I, I would completely agree with that. It's also, you know, a, a, a true DAO is basically just coding. And then going back to my earlier comments about the community, um, when you're doing due diligence, understanding the community, who the, uh, not necessarily the whales, but who the influ influencers are and what their motivation is. I think that's very important. I, I do know not to put Paul on the spot, but m m many VCs do not actually participate in the governance voting for legal reasons. So they may be whales, they hold a lot of tokens, they trade those tokens, but they, they monitor the governance, but they don't actually um, uh, you know, participate in the voting. So hopefully that changes because they, they probably know, the, you know these funds are so deep, have such deep knowledge that having them uh, have some type of impact in, in my opinion would be very helpful. Um, but yeah, that's the, uh, that's the future. And from a regulatory standpoint, we've talked about regulation. Who do they send a Wells notice to? The SEC. There's nobody, right? So it's the true DAO, uh, you know, in a sense becomes a, a utility, a true utility. So I, I agree. I think that's a, I, I, I think that's going to spurt the growth of DeFi. Hey, Jamil, we have time yep. just for like closing. Yep. Uh, I want to thank, uh, thank you, Marty. I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, this has been an amazing conversation. Um, it's been a great opportunity. Um, I hope everybody has, you know, enjoys the rest of the, uh, the conference. And uh, thank you very much, Marty. <laughs> Thanks. Right. Thank you very much, thank guys. Thank you, Jamil. Great job, guys. Thanks thank so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, thank you, Marty. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. Great. Um, it's interesting. I was having a conversation with somebody about crypto and I said, you know, all this code has been written. It can't be unwritten. All right. It's like the internet. So um, I, th I think that there will be a meeting of all of this technology at some point soon.